All right, hello and welcome to this sixth episode of the American Soccer Crash Course. Um, back here with our crew today, it's Halloween, so if you're watching on YouTube, you uh, you may notice our, our fits here. Lodge, why don't you go first? Sure. Uh, Marty McFly from Back to the Future, although I will take Han Solo. I heard that one too. So, yeah. What about you, Mac? Farmer John. All right, Farmer John, Farmer John. from from Backwoods, Wisconsin. Is that right? Yep. Nice. Oh, nice. Kind of Milwaukee. Okay, um, Mac, we're uh, we're we're help, happy to help, happy to have you back on the pod as our uh, as our casual guest. You're a big hit. We had uh, we had somebody in the comments seriously seriously asking for you back. So uh, love to be here. Uh, we're, we're we're happy to have you back. Finally, I am a Hawaiian punch, Hawaiian shirt. Sorry, it's, it's, it's okay. It's fucking yeah. five five out of ten. Kind of low effort, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very low effort, very low effort. <laughs> 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 says marty mcfly over here um <laughs> all right yeah well, we're uh we're pumped to be giving you this this episode of the american soccer crash course um just go over our agenda today we're going to be talking about our main man today tyler adams my favorite player on the u.s men's national team and the real captain america uh any excuse to get mac doing some some english vocab terms we're going to take it and so we're going to do uh more more british Soccer terminology vocab, mm -hmm. rapid fire. Max is going to think on his feet. Um, and the big thing, which we've been eager to deliver this one to you for a little while now, is just the kind of beefy, angsty dynamic of the U.S. men's national team fans, where that comes from, and what it kind of manifests in. So mm -hmm. uh, real quick, we're going to show you a video on Tyler Adams, just giving you kind of a sense of who this dude is. So There is some big sacrifices that I made over my youth years. My parents specifically made the most and they drove endless amounts of hours per week to New Jersey and back to New York. You know, in the beginning, my mom would go to work from 8 to 4.30, get out of work, pick me up from the house, drive straight to Jersey, drive back home. And at that point, I mean, it was almost a four hour round trip, so two hours each way. And we would get in the house at 12 and she's waking up at 6 the next morning and, and doing it again and when my stepdad who I call my dad came into my life with my brothers it was an amazing moment in my life because not only did he make me happy my mom happy he helped take the load off of my mom and and share the responsibility um, for what it was going to take to, to put me in the position I am in today yeah, everyone says that you learn a bit more from a loss than you do from 100%. a win. Saudi Arabia next. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, everyone would pick the U.S. favorites yeah. for this one. How'd you guys regroup, get in the right mental state for that one? We're never, we never want to go into a game thinking that we're the favorites. We've, we've had this underdog mentality for a long time now. Um, playing Saudi Arabia, we again know they have quality. Another World Cup opponent as well. Um, so we have to bring our A game. We need a better performance than what we reached today. Tyler, thanks so much. Yeah, see you Tuesday. Welcome. Yeah, see you Tuesday. Back yeah. to you guys. Yeah. He also mentioned that they wanted I'll to just say this. this. I love Tyler Adams. I love, he, like, that kid from the time he was 16 talked like a captain, and every time he just says exactly what you want to hear. Told me to F off when he was 16, and I was like, <laughs> uh, on uh, the field. Who hasn't of done course. that? Yeah, on the field. Um, but that's when I knew he was special. Um, so, today's main man, Tyler Adams, got a, got a little glimpse of him there. Um, I like to show that clip just because in all his interviews, a lot of times he, he attributes his, like, upbringing which is a pretty unique and cool one to who he is, who he is on the field, mm -hmm. um, and kind of like the just the absolute always got his teammates back kind of guy he is. So, yeah. uh, Lodge, you want to take it away here? Tell us a little bit about sure. Tyler Adams. Tyler, as it was mentioned in the video, uh, from New York, grew up uh, 75 miles away from New York City. Um, growing up, would travel to Jersey for all of his practices for the um, New York Red Bull team. Um, single mom, uh, grew up with not much as it was mentioned um, additionally the quote that kind of stood out to me was our life was a roller coaster and we were never quite sure if it was going to stay on the tracks so that's pretty turbulent um, additionally he talked about how um, his dad his stepdad coming into his life definitely played a big factor um, kind of helping him out there um, as well as brothers and sisters that kind of came into the family as well so he only just sort of touched on it there but like it was basically with his just with his mom until he was like in high school and then a kid on the soccer team went up to him and was like hey i think our parents are like talking and then so he like basically went into this whole family uh and you know had this dad and stuff but pretty cool pretty cool so he played for the new york red bull academy 
which as we went over on last episode, you can think of academies like if NBA teams bought all the AAU teams and put them under their own branding. Gotcha. So like he played for the New York Red Bulls, you know, U11 team. Like you said, he was like 75 miles north of New York City, so he would literally drive, like as they mentioned, two hours like every single day yeah. for seven years of his life, mm-hmm. which is just crazy. That's commitment. I mean, that's commitment, man. Yeah. Um, and so he's he's that's something he like really emphasizes. Like I'm always the type of guy to put the work in. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, he uh, his dad was really his mentor in that respect. Uh, his dad, I guess, was like from or had some Scottish roots, so he he knew he had some ball knowledge, mm-hmm. um, and was be, became his mentor in terms of like what his career was going to look like. So, um, we talk a little bit about the New York Red Bulls. For those of you who know sports, you may know that the Red Bull is an energy drink that decides they need to literally get involved in everything. It's Every, kind of the, kind everything. of the worst in yeah. my opinion, but uh, <laughs> pretty, somewhat predictably, they are in soccer and they do have like a pretty they have a philosophy. Just like in F one, their whole thing is like we're gonna do the pit stops the fastest. They have a bit of a philosophy in soccer. So, Lodge, our, our tactician here, why don't you tell us about that? Sure. So as Christian, Christian kind of alluded to, um, Red Bull has kind of three different teams. I think it's three. Um, Red Bull Salzburg, which is out of Austria, Red Bull, New York Red Bulls, which is out of obviously New York. And then kind of the main team or the one that's most prominently known worldwide, RB Leipzig, Red Bull Leipzig, uh, which is a German team. What they kind of all have in common, um, the two teams are almost like their farm teams. And so you have like a lot of younger guys come through. Sure. Um, Tyler ended up going to RB Leipzig after spending some time at the New York Red Bulls. Um, really, it was a great direct path for Europe, uh, to Europe for a lot of players. Um, I think there's honestly yeah. one more guy doing it right now, yep. Yep. Caden Clark, I want to say. Um, but the philosophy that they kind of employ is high pressing. Uh, it's known as gagging pressing. So usually it's younger players or players with high fitness levels attacking um, high up the pitch and then really just trying to trap teams in. And so think of it like um, full court press. I Got say. it. Okay. So like they're full court pressing. They're going through um, trying to trap up the field, make them make a mistake, make the defenders make a mistake, playing with the ball, um, and then just kind of high octane, always going at it, always giving 100%. So that's the system he grew up in developing, and he's definitely kept that kind of mantra and play level um, or play style throughout his career. I kind of think of – we've talked about how Christian Plissett can be a little bit of a variable performance guy because his game is like – He's got the ball. He's got tricks. So he's going to try to, like, beat you with tricks, essentially, get by you. Mm-hmm. And so if he's not doing that confidently, he can it can lead to him not playing very well. Uh, well, Tyler Adams is different in that he's just, like, running all the time. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, like, so his, his play style is, like, a little bit less volatile because, like, you can always count on him to just run hard, run and disrupt, right? right. And so, yep. so maybe the variability on the whole is, like, a little bit, a little bit less, but um, – but, yeah, so he's a center defensive mid, so it plays in the midfield, the more defensive side of things. Lodge, you want to break down, again, our tactician. What, what are, like, the different types of, of center defensive mids in, sure. you know, layman's terms? Yeah, so there's, I think, probably three. Um, number one, deep-lying playmaker, kind of a guy who sits back, sees the field, uh, will definitely get up high. Um, Paul Pugba comes to mind, if you know who that is. Um, I don't. He's, <laughs> That's why you're a casual fan. That's all exactly. good. Yeah. That's all good. So he's a uh, he's very beautiful way he plays, a lot of flicks, a lot of tricks, things like that. Sure. Um, and you'll end up seeing him score some pretty fantastic goals. Um, additionally, there's the distributor, whose sole job is to kind of sit back, kind of survey the field, um, and make decisions, make plays based on that, kind of just set the tempo, um, kind of like a quarterback in that way. Like a game yeah. manager. Game manager, like definitely a, a game manager. What was his name? The Jones guy that broke his leg, got his leg destroyed. Alex. Oh, Alex, Alex Smith. No, Alex Smith. Smith. Alex you. Smith. So yeah. kind of like not maybe not the most athletic player, but sort of a high IQ sort right. of. Yeah, 100%. Got yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, nice. There's one on Chelsea right now, Jorginho, who's exactly like that. Sure. Slow as hell, but – gets in the team every single time because of the, you know, the same qualities that you just mentioned. And soccer can be such like a chaotic game, right? So like you can almost feel like when he just puts his foot on the ball, like there's there's like a it's there's nothing crazy about it, but a lot of times mm-hmm. there's just like a calmness to it. Right. That that settles everyone down and like gets everyone in the groove. Yeah. And then lastly, um, actually the kind of play style that Tyler Adams has is a destroyer. A destroyer's role is specifically to go in, win the ball back 
kind of fuck shit up for lack of a better term. <laughs> um, N'Golo Conte, who's also on Chelsea, is a good one. Casemiro and those Real Madrid teams, Spanish team, a lot of very, um, not very technical, but very physical. They're going to set the tone. Um, if their team's kind of starting to fall by the wayside a little bit, they'll almost like fire them up by getting a yellow card, by going and just getting stuck yeah. into a tackle. <laughs> Cleaning somebody out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's quite a few of those throughout the years. That's usually the most common sense of a center defensive mid, I would say. Um, and Tyler Adams is probably to a T uh, what we would consider a destroyer. Yeah. Um, kind of funny you mentioned N'Golo Conte, right? Because he's like a destroyer, uh, but he is known for being like the nicest, sweetest guy, which right. is kind of funny. So Tyler Adams is more commonplace, or he, and he even turns turns it up a notch. He's just like the dude who's got his teammates back. So um, I can probably throw up a GIF here, but or, yeah. excuse me, the producer can throw up a GIF. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, there was this moment this weekend in a game where one of Tyler Adams' teammates – who's also another American player who they, they play on the same club team in England, but uh, he gets like tackled by a guy or like pushed over by a guy. And then the guy like, kicks the ball at him because the guy was just kind of, it wasn't that, it wasn't like that intense, but he was, yeah. he was pissed off and he kicked the ball. And so Tyler Adams just comes flying out and gets in his face. And that's like, that's who he is. He like, Jesus. he embodies not only everything he does in the field, but then he takes it up a notch and he's like the scrappiest guy on the field. Bit of, bit um, of a jackass, honestly, but yeah, it's, it's awesome when he's on your team. He's the type of player you hate playing against. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's he, so funny because he seems like I was going to say it. He seems like such a like G shucks kind of guy when you look at him. Cause he just seems so nice. Almost yeah. So kind nice. Of, mm-hmm. You know, Really, be really laid back, kind of chill. But I mean, Jesus, it sounds like he's kind of a kind of a nightmare to deal with. Well, I, Mac, I think you I, you picked up picked up on the you passed the vibe check here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's I think that's exactly right. Like he's my favorite player on the team. I do love the the fuck shit up kind of stuff. But mm-hmm. he's like, you know, he's in this wave of players um, that went to Europe originally, which would include Christian Pulisic, Weston McKenney. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, those are like the, the big three of the USA, if you will, right? And sure. so he, they, he's been getting interviewed since the time he was like 18. Um, and he's just like super astute, and like very impressive. Mm-hmm. Seems like a really awesome kid. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I think he is. But yeah. That's just like when he's on the field, he's a different beast. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, to, you know, to have somebody who can flip the switch like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so just to go over his career, uh, Mac, it's a good thing you're here today. It's kind of a kind of a best of both worlds situation because uh, you had a, you had a funny sound bite about the MLS <laughs> last week. But uh, Tyler Adams is actually a dude who, despite his young age, he's uh, he's 23, 24 years old. Sure, um, he's played both the MLS and Europe. Uh, huh. So to tell you a story, um, from age 11 to age 18, he would make that huge trek down to New Jersey where the New York Red Bulls are, mm-hmm. uh, and so eventually he really came up within their academy. You know, started playing with even better, bigger teams within their system. So say sure. he, say he's thirteen, he's playing with the U sixteen stuff like that. Um, and at sixteen years old, he was ready for the the big boys to play in the MLS, uh, which was cool. And so um, that kind of that fire that we talked about was was apparent from a, the very beginning. He was very much at that age still like a vocal leader in the sense that he was like yelling at teammates and all this stuff. And Jesus, um, I almost can't believe it. He just seemed, it just, wow. I mean, that's shocking. He just seems like such a cool guy. Yeah. He really, <laughs> he really does. Sounds like an asshole, though. Yeah. <laughs> but he's kind of the good asshole, right? So he, he backed up, you know, he was asked about it like, dude, you are screaming at your like 20 year something year old teammates. You're 17. And, and, to, to know him, you have to know his, his story, right? And he points to the fact that he grew up with little. He made tremendous sacrifices. And, like, yep. and as arrogant as it may sound, no one else is going to let him down, so to speak, with their work yes. rate and their effort. Cause he's, I do he, get that. He's bringing the intensity. He feels like everyone should be there, right. um, regardless of who he is or what his age was. Appreciate what you have, kind of. I think yeah. that's what he's trying to go for. And I, I can respect that. I get that. Yeah, exactly. Farmer like you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, ra- I grain my corn or whatever. I, I put it in the silo. It's Everyone's got to pull their weight. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, uh, so he, he played in the MLS. Um, and this is something that our U.S. men's national team coach has been preaching. Um, 
it was a little bit against what Pulisic was saying. Pulisic's view was like, hey, get over to Europe when you're 16 because it's crucial. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. coach is actually more promoting an, an idea of play well in the MLS, establish yourself, and then make the jump. So Tyler Adams is more like that kind of establish, establish himself, kind of get, get some time. Um, sure. And so he, he actually, I believe he won the MLS with uh, Sounds right. with uh, the New York Red Bulls at age 16, 17, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, Lodge, why don't you tell us about, tell us about that next step in his career? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so kind of after making the jump to Europe, um, he went specifically to RB Leipzig, as we mentioned, the German team and the Red Bull system. Um, quickly had some success um, at one point when I think Pulisic was dropping off a little bit, had a little trial trials and tribulations in his career as we mentioned injuries and whatnot mm -hmm. um he was actually considered probably the best player um for the u.s men's national team which is great um especially at such a young age as we're mentioning um within the u.s men's national team as soon as he came in um definitely was one of the star figures you know as we mentioned he's a destroyer so he was going in and fucking shit up <laughs> um Vocal presence definitely led him to be a natural leader within the squad. Him, Christian, um, kind of just by nature, and then Weston, as we said, kind of the big three for us at this point. Um, really, because he was so young, as we've mentioned, all of these guys came up together, had so much time together, and they've started to really develop and become the leaders in this team. Honestly, from they're still considered almost the old guard, but they've that's just because they're the longest standing in the squads. Like they're still 23, 24 our age. Um, but they have the most experience. They have the most um, kind of knowledge of the game. Um, they've lived through the tough times of missing the last World Cup. But, yeah, um, I think moving forward, uh, kind of – it wasn't necessarily a turbulent career at Leipzig, um, but he did definitely kind of run his race. Um, actually ended up at the end of last year. I believe it was last year. Yep. Was, yeah. Um, he ended up – kind of transferring, as we mentioned, uh, transfers from the last episode, uh, transferring to Leeds United uh, for the okay. Premier League um, to kind of reunite with his old coach. Uh, also, another thing that we haven't mentioned yet, Jesse Marsh, um, one of the coaches currently um, the U a U.S.-born coach, uh, specifically um, kind of went through the Red Bull system almost at the same time as Tyler. And sure. so he was the coach for the New York Red Bulls. And then he went to RB Leipzig, was the coach there, if I remember correctly. Went to Salzburg. 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 So Another he went the opposite Red, route. You know Red Bull just buying every team in Europe. They have multiple teams. So yeah. He, he went up the pipeline. So he went to that farm system um, and then ended up becoming the Leeds coach as well um, and kind of reunited with Tyler at the beginning of this season. So it's kind of been funny to see. They almost had a little bit of a career trajectory difference. Um, they went to the two Red Bull teams in Europe, but then they reunited um, at the – basically the U.S. team um, in the Premier League, I yeah. would say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, super super cool to see to see Americans basically have, having their own kind of group in the Premier League. So, yeah, Marsh is the coach of Leeds, and then he has Adams on his team, and he also has that other guy, uh, Tyler – or, excuse me, Brendan Aronson. And so that's been a, been a fun thing as, as somebody who enjoys watching – uh, Americans abroad and uh, on in the, kind of the club USA. games. Yes, hell yeah! It's a, it's Leeds United States as they call it. It's Le teams oh. Leeds United. Oh, so is is Leeds United where a lot of the U.S. and players historically have played, or is it just no, just recent no, history? Just now, just recent because of this this new coach. Being oh, there. sure. Okay. He's actually from Racine, Wisconsin. Really? Yeah. How about it? Oh, is that the guy that they based? Uh Face that show off of? No, but he's been getting a lot of Ted Lasso comparisons. Oh, Ted Lasso. And he's, uh, I think he's fed up with it, to be honest. He, he <laughs> said he's never seen it, and he was like, I don't want to see it. Don't want to don't have that image in my head. Make, make me worse or whatever. Um, but, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a funny kind of meme going around right now. Um, Leeds United just beat Liverpool, uh, which is a very big team for them to beat. Um, he was kind of on the hot seat, Jesse, Mar Jesse Marsh was before then. Um, but every time that Leeds gets a big win in the Premier League, you see kind of tweets go out and people firing off. It's called soccer. Uh, you just got soccer. <laughs> <laughs> so you just got Jesse Marsh. It's called soccer. It's been kind of firing off in the Twitter sphere the past couple of days. Yeah, it was. Uh, it feels like he's like a. 45 50 year old guy who's just like still living in his like 20 year old self body he just had this hilarious celebration with just like the most emphatic fist bump you've ever seen. <laughs> yeah um, 
All right, and real quick, uh, we're just going to show you this TikTok before we go to break of uh, Tyler Adams. Taking a shot every time half. Tyler says. Obviously, it wasn't the start that important. we wanted, um, but it's important that we're able to grind out results and at the minimum get a point out of that. First off, a little bit more awkward. They, they seem to slow the game down and frustrate you a bit. Yeah, it's a little bit frustrating, obviously, in the first half when they're already trying to kill time, uh, especially when, when we want to play a high-tempo game. Um, but again, it's important that we don't get frustrated. We stayed mentally focused. It was important to get the goal for us. Signings are settling nicely. Sinistero as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's important that he's able to get minutes now, uh, and you saw a little bit of a glimpse of what he's able to do, so he's going to be an important player for us moving forward. You had to battle through a couple of things like Rodrigo's shoulder industry. That didn't help. Yeah, of course. Rodrigo's an important player for us. Obviously, he scored a bunch of goals for us. A dangerous guy. Um, I hope that he's all right. I didn't quite see what happened. I think it was his shoulder, but yeah, I hope that he's all right. In terms of the season so far, happy? Yeah, I think that, you know, we it's a learning process for us. A lot of new guys coming into a new league, trying to adapt. Um, but it's important that we're able to pick up points early on in the season. All right, we're back. Max ready. He's ready to get grilled. Um, had a blast doing vocab with him last time. And the subject was really like English soccer slang and terms. Um, and we could do this all all day, really. We're going to go we're going to go back to the well. So, Lodge, you want to lead it off? Start 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 Mac off. Sure. So the first one that we're going to go with uh, for general soccer sayings, this one comes straight out of the Premier League. Uh, but can he do it on a cold, rainy night in Stoke? What do you think that means? So it's like a, it's posed as like a question. But can he do it on a cold, rainy night in Stoke? Hmm. I'm going to bet that Stoke is a one of the tougher crowds or arenas to play in because the crowd's kind of loud. And cold and rainy, I mean, you know, it's just a cold, rainy environment, slippery. Mm -hmm. The ball's going to be slippery, too. You might bottle it if you kick it. How about that? How about that? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah so that's that's on the right track, definitely. Yeah. Um, this kid's always on the right track. Yeah, he definitely speaking. is. speaking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really what it refers to is a lot of players not playing in the Premier League. Um, so they play in Spain usually, um, teams like Barcelona, Real Madrid, who play a very kind of sexy style where it's kind of possession based, a lot of flicks la and la. tricks and stuff like that. <laughs> and a lot of people kind of just say, but can they do it on a cold rainy night in Stoke? Meaning can they go up against a bunch of guys that are going to get stuck in and tackle you and not oh, let you play very it. pretty. And uh, so, so it's like off, it's also used in jest because of how English people may have such a high opinion of their soccer culture that it's like. That they're like, oh, he's playing at Barcelona, but can he do it on a rainy, cold night in Stoke? Like somebody said, <laughs> somebody said that about Messi one time. It's just, it's so it's it's pretty funny. But mm -hmm. um, Mac, what is Boxing Day? Boxing Day. You know what? I'm gonna bet that is maybe in light of your conversation last week. It, maybe it's transfer season, and the kids that aren't doing very good, box up your stuff. You're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so boxing that gets its name is the day after Christmas and traditionally it's a day where like I guess servants would receive gifts and they had the day off from like very rich you know aristocratic things or whatever not like I'm familiar with in small town Wisconsin <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> wow exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, no no days off in small town Wisconsin no no, no. and uh, but so what it is today that's just like the, the name but today, it's kind of like you can think of like NBA Christmas, uh, where they have like all the basketball games. It's like a day where you have ten soccer games on it on like mm -hmm. all day. So it's like that. It's a day everyone just kind of like hangs out, and watches soccer. Yeah, so, kind of like football and Thanksgiving, something like that. It's a, it's so, a great day. Yeah, yeah. sweet day. Mm -hmm. um, next up, poacher's goal. A poacher's goal. Oh, okay. I'm gonna say this is when one player did all the work. Got the ball up the field, primed to get a nice kick in. Maybe someone, maybe he biffs it or bottles it or something. Or, uh -huh. But mm -hmm. someone kind of just maybe does a little bit of work to tip it in. The goal goes to them. They yeah. get the credit. That's 90. Yeah, that's. Ty goes exactly. to the runner. We'll give it to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's good. That's right there. Um, yeah, poacher's goal is definitely, as you mentioned, um, a lot of guys doing a lot of work or somebody messing up and kind of just being right place, right time. Um, a lot of players like that, um, usually strikers that are just kind of there. Hunt hunters are kind of being in that ball hawks is how I would kind of think of it. But yeah. always in the right place, just ready to push something in, usually bang, bang plays. Yeah, it's like a real, real skill to just be able to, even if it's not pretty, just score when you're in and around the, in the, in and around the ball. So. 
Um, Mac, what is a knock? What's a knock? Yeah, what's a knock? Well, you know, like when you say you don't want to knock them for it, but that sounds like more like a U.S. term. So maybe what I'm going to say is, is that a knock is when maybe you accidentally nut tap somebody on the field. <laughs> <laughs> Make it, I don't know. Make it sort of. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty close. Yeah. Uh, it's like uh, it's like when somebody has like an injury that is like kind of just like a non-specific like, like you just got like kicked really hard, and so oh, okay. and so you're like out of the game. You don't have like a strain of the blah blah blah. It's just like you just have like probably a gigantic bruise. Yeah. Got it. Pretty, okay. Pretty damn close. Mm-hmm. Nice. Per, per usual. No taps in there. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Next up, we have park the bus. So if I were to say that team is really parking the bus right now. Oh, um, okay. Uh, they're parking the bus because they're playing like such shit. The, they called the bus driver. We're leaving early. Park the bus. <laughs> we're hopping in. <laughs> so uh, park the bus is, mo- is like when a team is just playing so defensively that they are all just basically like standing in the penalty box, mm-hmm. like or in and around that area, and mm-hmm. just like trying to not let anyone through, not attempting to any play play any offense of their own. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a metaphorical bus that they just put up in front of the goal so nothing can get through. Oh, there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, Mac, that that was it's actually incredible how just on these you are. So what's screamers? What's a screamer? Oh, Jesus. Uh. Uh, I I want to say fans, but that seems too easy. So maybe what I'm gonna say is is a screamer is maybe the kind of like a Tyler Adams, maybe the player on the team that's kind of the leader, screaming a bunch at him. Maybe maybe a little berating, but you know he's got a heart of gold, and they love him at the end of the day. <laughs> I like that explanation. So a screamer is unfortunately when you kick a ball like. Like just an absolute bullet shot that goes into the net. Mm-hmm. Oh, they call that a screamer. Okay. But that I makes like, a little yeah. more sense. What I, I, was I like yours. Yeah, I like yours a little bit. Yeah. Um, other terms are worldy. If it's like a worldy goal, um, like it's fantastic. It's just incredible. Like world class is what they say. Um, okay. A firecracker is another term used for it. See that one? I kind of yeah. That's that's more along the lines of a goal yeah. screamer. <laughs> yeah, screamer screamers. Yeah, definitely something you have to watch a little bit to understand. Um, next one, I would say at sixes and sevens. So these two are at sixes and sevens with each other. This is I always save this one for last because this is a hard one. Yeah. I still don't even understand it, and I've heard it a million times. Mm-hmm. Can only think of six, eight, seven. I mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> seven, eight, can you, nine. Can you repeat that one? Yeah. So it's called. So to use it in a sentence, sure, mm-hmm. it would be like the defenders are sixes and sevens. Oh Jesus! Oh, maybe that's like, it's got to be maybe in reference to the like a unit of measurement. Maybe they're away from the goal a certain amount. They're See, at sixes and sevens, like in prime positions on the field. Or? The truth is I don't even know what it means. Really? I just know what the context is. And the context <laughs> is, <laughs> this is kind of bad on my part, uh, but the context is like whenever defenders are just having, just getting run all over the place and like maybe the offense is like, you know, all of, like it looks like they're going to score or whatever and they're just scrambling. That's what they're called at sixes and sevens. Yeah. So like defenders huh. are at sixes and sevens with each other. They're at, they're at odds. They're kind of confused. They're oh. not working as a group. So it, oh. so it's like odds versus evens. Mm-hmm. Oh. So okay. They're they're all sixes and sevens. Yeah. Nice. So sense. it's a it's a weird one. Yeah. If you're gonna get even with me, I'm gonna get odd with you. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. Huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Um. All right, Matt. Or excuse me, Lot. You want to take away? Uh, this this big thing um, today we want to talk about the like the crux of the U.S. fan culture. Um, this is something that m- might be a little bit hard to put our put your finger on, but it really permeates the entire discourse around the U.S. men's national team, mm-hmm. um, including the portrayal in the media, the you know what happens on Twitter, stuff like that. Um, and I would say it, it starts with a fan base thirsty for success, but it gets a lot uglier than that. So, sure. Lodge, you want to you take this, this quote for sure. us? Yeah, so the quote is from Christian Pulisic, uh, specifically from the Players' Tribune in 2017. I think this was just coming off uh, not making the last World Cup. Yep. If I remember correctly, that's when this article came out. But uh, the quote goes, in the U.S. system, too often the best player on an under-17 team um, under 17, U17, um, will be treated like a star. Not having 
to work for the ball, being the focus of the offense at all times, etc. at a time when they should be having to fight tooth and nail for their spot. In Europe, on the other hand, the average level of ability around you is just so much higher. It's a pool of players where everyone has been the best player and everyone is fighting for a spot, truly week in and week out, which makes the intensity and humility that you need to bring to the field every day, both from a mental and physical perspective, just unlike anything you can really experience in U.S. developmental soccer. So pretty pretty scathing there. I mean, I, I love that paragraph because, as we're going to get to, there's a central conflict, and it outlines one side of that argument so nicely, mm-hmm. which is just basically that, hey, if you want to get better, the best thing to do is surround yourself with people who are fighting tooth and nail. That doesn't have to be anything wrong with wanting players to go to Europe. It's just very f- matter of fact from Pulisic. So to t- further elaborate on that story, um, Pulisic really turned U.S. heads back in like 2016-ish when he, when he made his breakthrough. He's 17 at Dortmund, as we talked about in our profile with him. Um, and amidst this disappointment of missing the World Cup, we had a star on a really big team um, and he had this message, which was, hey, we need kids to get developed in the system and get over to Europe when they can because that's where they're really going to make the most headway. Mm-hmm. Um, this message really resonated with fans. At a time when they want, just wanted something to hold on to, this was it, right? Um, and so here comes the conflict to this message, which is that U.S. soccer does not get a ton of mainstream media coverage. Mm-hmm. Um, you actually like probably know a couple of their mainstream media members because they've just been around forever, like Alexi Lalas. I don't know if you know who, do you know who that is, Mac. He's a, I think so. He's the the ginger guy. Yes, the yeah, he's head, like yeah. the one soccer head in all of America, right? Yeah. Um, and so I want you to think of these guys as quote unquote big soccer, like ESPN, Fox. Those are that's big soccer, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, big soccer has TV deals with the MLS, right? The MLS is currently. As it stands, it's going to tr- change next year to a big deal with Apple TV, which is great, great for the sport in the U.S. Let's be clear. We are all for it, for the growth of the MLS. Mm-hmm. Up until this point, it's had t- like ties with ESPN, Fox, um, and even like just regional sports networks, right? So you have lots of stakeholders in the system. I'm seeing the problem. <laughs> why, why, don't you get a, why don't you jump ahead for us? I'm kind well, of getting what are you the feeling? idea here. It's sort of, uh, what's the word for it? It's a dialectical issue where you have the truth of the matter that if we want to be anywhere near as good as even, you know, Iran, Italy, Spain, all those outfits, we have to improve. But, of course, as it is now, I think all these ESPNs and all them kind of like how it is now. They don't want all this drastic improvement, and they, they certainly don't want kids – leaving to go to those other teams. And it's, it's kind of an issue because how do you improve a team if you're telling them to leave? But right. also, well, they kind of have to because right now it's kind of a short-term versus long-term kind of arrangement. And I mm-hmm. guess I'm not even really sure what the right answer is. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think something you said in there about them wanting to stay is definitely nail on the head. You have guys like Alexi Lalas who – God knows why, but he keeps on talking about how he wants Aaron Long, somebody we've talked about a little bit. Really, they want players who are from the MLS to be in that team because it furthers their agenda that the, the MLS national is team great. That is. The, the national team, I should say, that they're in there. Um, really just to kind of further that agenda that the MLS is good, um, which isn't necessarily to say that it isn't. However, um, a lot of people have this strong opinion that going from a young age, getting, as we mentioned, Christian Pulisic said, playing with the best of the best all the time, um, 24-7, as opposed to just kind of being the guy by yourself, you can't really – you kind of hit your ceiling a little bit quicker. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so like Lodge said, some of these dudes, they really advocate for these. Once the MLS players do well, they want them in the team. They advocate for them to be on the team. Um, and it's not just those media members. It's also other, like, fans. Because there's lots of fans – you know, we're all trying to get to the same place, right? Yeah. We're all trying to get to our Mr. Brightside moment, as we've, we've coined it, where the U.S – really bursts on the world stage but um people just have different ideas of how we're going to get there and there's some fans who believe that the mls and having a very successful soccer league in the u.s is like an integral part of that Mm -hmm. it's it's a debate to be had i don't personally think so My, my personal thought is that when you 
like I wake up and watch soccer at 10 a.m., right? And then I watch like college football mm -hmm. on Saturdays, right? Yep. Yeah. Like I don't think that the going in person part is so integral. I'd, I'd rather – I think like people just – stream and watch tv and that's mm -hmm. a bigger deal in terms of eyeballs than yeah. the actual game day experience and i think having a game day experience is very cool and very good but i'm not i'm just not sure it's like you know top top of the pecking order in terms of mm -hmm. importance i think but, i think there's more than one way to skin a cat i'm yeah. definitely going to say that but it's kind of like do you want to have to set up an entire system wait for everybody to kind of evolve on that level and then have the success? Or would you like to use an already in place system um, that exists yeah. in Europe, have players develop there. And then once we have that success and we have people, you know, seeing how good we are, then that kind of brings it back to the MLS to say, Oh, we have so many more players that want to develop here. Um, and we're just going to have uh, a lot of players do that. So it's kind of definitely people are at odds and you'll see it all over Twitter, all over social media, um, you know, people saying, "Oh, well, the MLS players have to get a stop. They have to get they have to get a start in the team." But yeah, yeah, uh, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, um, and to be clear, just because you advocate for certain MLS players doesn't mean you are necessarily a you know MLS junkie who isn't sure. can't see straight and has a gigantic bias. There are some great um, ones in there, yeah. Yeah, um, but. Because of the lack of mainstream soccer coverage, you get these guys with just concentrated power. They have a certain way they feel about about how soccer should happen in the U.S., right? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. probably too big of an ask. And, uh, maybe, I mean, the, the league, it is, it's worth noting that the league, MLS, has gotten better and better and better lately. Significantly. It's and it's only sure. becoming more popular. But, um, yeah, and, I, you know, I don't mean to paint it like it's such a forward – outrage thing where they're like their agenda is so deep rooted that they don't want people to go to Europe but it's it's more just like the unreasonable suggestions about guys like Aaron Long playing mm -hmm. it's the just it's just the little things it's the suggestions that guys are playing well in the MLS and that should directly translate um, and even more so I think the one thing that U.S. soccer fans hate is just the lack of flack or attack that they they give to some of these mm -hmm. players when they play bad like in any other not only soccer league but like sports league in america you know like think about like anthony davis on the lakers right he's yeah. playing poorly and everyone is like pissed right now like they're they're not happy mm -hmm. um but in the mls it just kind of feel like oh well it's okay you know, it is what it well, whatever will happen. You yeah, know. they're almost given a little bit more of a pass, like specifically yeah. um, center backs. We have a lot of conversations about center backs. We're going to keep on coming back to them kind of throughout our podcast. But um, there's a couple guys that are playing pretty well in Europe right now. Um, teams that are in the Premier League, uh, teams that are in the Portuguese League, um, but they're possibly not getting good looks or they're criticized a lot more um, compared to guys we keep on to going back to Aaron Long um, mm -hmm. other center backs who are in the MLS who you know I think I, he was the player of the year we'll give him that like a couple years ago but he definitely hasn't done it's kind of like what have you done for me recently yeah. and you have a lot more guys that are probably doing a little bit better just not in the MLS that are kind of given a little they're almost like I would say burdened for it or penalized for it yeah for not playing in the MLS not having those eyeballs yeah, um, and so the people who – it's kind of funny. It's a, I, and I really can't, like, emphasize enough how much this permeates the discourse, but the people who are like, hey, like, I would put myself in this, um, maybe not to the extent that our other host, Max Heath, would be in. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he said, if a player's in Europe, I want him. But <laughs> they call people who strictly want the Europe people, like – Euro snobs. <laughs> so, so like, oh, you don't want this MLS player just because he plays in the MLS. Oh, you're a Euro snob. So the uh, the Euro snob, it's it's like it's it's like Democrats and Republicans just disagreeing on how to get to the same place, move the country forward. Sure, um, that's the same thing in soccer between the MLS proponents and the Euro snobs. Um, Logic, are you a, are you a proud Euro snob? Uh, I'm I'm a Euro snob. Let's <laughs> let's let's get it out there. I'm a, I'm a Euro snob. I don't mean to talk politics, but I am a Euro snob. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, whatever consternation that that topic causes within the U.S. fan base, Greg Berhalter, our coach, got a huge gallon of gasoline and just dumped it on the fire when oh, yeah. he became coach. Jesus. Because what he did, Mac, is he had 
all these MLS dudes come in because he used to coach in the MLS. And he had this, like, uh, especially the first couple of years, he had just had this big-time favoritism of some of these dudes. And as a fan, you sat there and you were like, ugh, well, it, this guy's the coach. You get, you know, hired to be the coach. So I should just trust him here. And then you watch some of these MLS dudes and you're like, oh, my Lord. There was one game where we're, uh, we were down 1-0 and he took Pulisic off the field. It put on this guy, Paul Ariola. Lightning rod. <laughs> He's a lightning rod for oh, fans yeah. because we can't stand him. <laughs> we cannot stand him. <laughs> He's, he just like, it's, oh, my God. It's it's so hard to watch. Um, I'm, I'm trying to be as neutral as possible. Not doing a good job. Um, but, but, like, th- there's that, right? So fans on Twitter just go insane. And they're like, you know, we just want a – soccer fan base that's taken seriously because soccer is the butt of the joke like so often right and there's just this adherence to some of uh some of these dudes who you just you could scratch your head all day with mm-hmm. some of these guys and and let's mention that that game ended 2-0 that game we yeah. were down 1-0 we subbed off our best player not really arguably but at the time definitely our best player yeah Rod and paul ariel and end up losing 2-0 so yeah. not that was definitely, you know, kind of the beginning of adding his fuel to the flame. It, was, it wasn't great. Yeah, and so over time, he's, he's really had certain guys who he sticks to. A lot of them are in, in the MLS, and it's just been a point of endless frustration. Um, and so whatever, whatever angst, if you were to turn the dial up, that turns it up. Let's say it's 0 to 10, that turns it up to like 6. And then there's other things that really just snowball. And so the insecurity of missing the last World Cup. Mm-hmm. Uh, to give you context, in the third game of World Cup qualifying, out of 14 games, the U.S. were down 1-0 at half, and they only had w- one draw in the, f- the previous – or I should say they had they'd drawn twice in the previous two games. Mm-hmm. So in game three, they were losing. And I have never seen hell breaking loose on Twitter quite like this. It was like people just losing their minds like, oh, my God, we're not going to make the World Cup. Holy shit, we're going to have to blow it all up again. We're wasting all our talent. Um and so there's just like a massive insecurity because there was no reason the U.S. should have missed the last World Cup, and that's exactly what happens. Um, so people people are ready to get at one another. Um, and we talked about big soccer. Big soccer has kind of come back a lot of the time and said, hey, you know what? The U.S. fan base, they're toxic. Now, oh. the thing about people who and fans who might be upset here and there is uh, – they don't exactly take that well. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. not um, and so the, the fans' retort is really, hey, we're being demanding, just like you know, fans of the Dallas Cowboys would be demanding. Or right. So um, I, I will say, I mean, it's Twitter, right? So like, it's by definition a little, yeah, a little I mean, bit there you toxic. Go. It's kind of a shitstorm in the first place. <laughs> yeah, and that can't be said for everyone, but people would definitely uh, get at each other's necks. I mean, and, and the other point about that is like, the U.S. soccer is an organizational dump, dumpster fire. You don't need to, like, as a casual fan, you probably know that, you know, the equal pay lawsuits. And, but just just the history of being terrible. I mean, even our coach was hired by his brother. That's, yeah. like, a real thing. This is crazy, mm-hmm. crazy. Um, I think my favorite part about kind of all of this is that the way that the schedule is set up, um, teams play only every couple months. And so you don't think about it like for a while, um, just how the U S men's team play because of all the club games and stuff like that. Okay. Um, and so you don't think about it for a couple months and then you're like, Oh, you're super excited for these games to come on. (laughs) And then like, uh, you as Christian said, blow it up, blow it up, dumpster fire. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing in sports because when the World Cup comes around, I'm going to forget that this team has ever done anything wrong. I'm going to be so fired up. Yeah. I mean, I'm watching the commercials. We got John Hamm playing Santa. I, I'm, I'm like through the roof with excitement. Um, but, yeah, so – and that's just to, to tell the story of the U.S. fan base, right? Um, mm-hmm. The other unique thing about this fan base, it all leads – it all kind of feeds into one another. But as much as there might be some beef between fans – the second anybody calls out one of our dudes, it's revolutionary war. So, um, so that that's happened a lot with the English fans, um, and particularly around like Christian Pulisic. Uh, although he's like a pretty shy guy and has a really reasonable demeanor, uh, lots of the Chelsea fans have like always targeted him mm-hmm. as like, oh, that's the reason our team's playing bad. And so it's this is just more comical than anything else, but our fans who are already used to fighting each other all day on Twitter, go out, go out there and just beef with all the Brits. Mm-hmm. Um, and they pile on all over the English players on that team, just 
like every single nade that can come out, they just go after. It's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, and the, just the amount of hyperbole that goes on, like somebody will tweet. There's one guy in particular who I, it's a bit obviously, but like 50, if Pulisic doesn't start that day, 15 minutes will go by and he'll go, I've seen enough. Put Pulisic on. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I would, the funny thing too is this is, you, you know, like I, I think Italian fans who are fans of the team Juventus, uh, that's a club team where Weston McKenney plays, sure. who's another one of our players. Um, I think they kind of like go on Twitter and trash Weston too, except we don't speak the same language. So, so it ends up just us versus the English all the time. And uh, the, the kind of funny thing about that is obviously we're playing in the World Cup. So like everyone's like, I can't wait until Pulisic scores in the 90th minute and shows these beans on toast losers what, <laughs> what we can do. Um, so, yeah, and uh, we use Tyler, Tyler Adams as an example here because he's a guy who played in the MLS mm-hmm. who, uh, who, then, who then hones his skills in Europe. So I, I don't think he'd be on either side of the MLS or Eurosnob debate. I think he'd say whoever's the best player, take that guy. And uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm probably like that too. It's just the best player is almost always in Europe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. But, yeah, he de- he's definitely emblematic of our fans, you know, fiery, always sticking up for each other. Definitely arguing yeah. with his teammates, as we mentioned earlier, trying to get the best out of them. Yeah. I think that's just kind of as we go with the U.S. men's team, probably a lot of the fans – argue within each other in that same way yeah way to put a bow on that lodge um yeah and l- l- my last point would just be we talked a little bit about the gasoline that was put on the fire if our coach decides to uh stick with the same guys the same mls guys he, he has just a couple favorites lying around uh there's going to be people on twitter taking things very poorly <laughs> so um yeah so i would just as uh, a little homework here I would check out the Players' Tribune article entitled Grateful uh, by Tyler Adams. It really just highlights his whole story. Just a really amazing kid. Mm-hmm. I love how it gets in people's face, but uh, I think part, one of the coolest things about him is just how, how much of a leader he is And uh, at 24 years old. He's, he's the leader of this U.S. men's national team, which was ripped apart a few years ago after a, after a failed World Cup um, and had to pick up the pieces and has – you know, permitted a guy so young to really take center stage in, in the leadership role. So I would take out, check out that article entitled Grateful. Um, so that's all we got for you today. This is fun, fun doing another yeah, thanks episode. Thanks for being back, guys. Yeah, thanks, yeah, Jack. Thanks for being here. Right. Another, another great performance. So uh, thanks, guys. Mm-hmm. I have a